Thank you, Rod. I'm, I'm honored to be uh, invited back here. And, and this is one of the best things about coming back is how much you, you still keep learning. I, I still consider this um, to be part of my fellowship training, Rod. So uh, you have to be nice to me, you know, uh, when I'm here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, asking us to be involved. So uh, my talk is really uh, about developments in lateral lumbar spine surgery. And in particular, as you'll see, I want to focus on a new development that's uh, uh, really occurred in the last year to year and a half. Uh, we, we use lateral interbody fusion uh, very successfully now as surgeons. You know, this is a very well established technique now that's been around for way more than a decade. Um, its advantages are obvious. We've talked about it, you know, on multiple occasions. It truly is the addition of this MIS approach to something that was present all along, and it helps us achieve our goals. And, and it improves the way we look after patients too. And you know, it's come with many different advantages. Obviously, you know, it's a powerful uh, correction technique, particularly in the coronal uh, plane. And then when you add things such as ALL division to it through an anterior column reconstruction, it really gives you so much more, especially for the uh, sagittal plane. So, so why, why change it? Why mess with something that's been so successful so far? Um, to me, I think it's about ad ad addressing its downsides and maximizing what it can do. So it still is, uh, neuropraxia and neural injury is still an issue with at least the trans-psoas uh, direct lateral approach. You know, it, it's, it's a significant sensory um, impact uh, particularly on branches of the lumbar plexus. And even up to 5% of cases, you can have a significant femoral neuropraxia uh, as a result of it. And, and so it's, it's not something uh, that, that we take lightly. We're very careful, uh, especially in the psoas muscle with the way we, we tackle it. But it's seen as a downside. You know, often, is the sagittal correction enough? You know, do we, do we get enough, uh, especially when we just put in inner body cages that don't have either the feature of ALL division uh, or, uh, uh, or, for example, expansion to them. You know, it can treat the lumbar sacral junction for obvious reasons because of the anatomy of the iliac crest. And positioning the patient in the lateral decubitus position, it takes time. You know, you, you have to uh, position them orthogonally for the purpose of uh, imaging. Uh, you are uh, spending significant time ensuring that they're uh, they're padded well, you know, the, the neuromonitoring is, is on and it's, uh, and it's subject to, uh, it's not subject to shifting or being displaced. And so the, the final piece of the puzzle is the fact that we often have to reposition these patients, either when we need to obtain posterior fixation or when we want to obtain direct decompression. It's, it's poor for that because in the lateral decubitus position at least, Direct decompression is is messy at the at the at the least. You know, it involves kind of significant um, uh, blood entering the field and readjusting the muscles and and so on with retractors. And as a result, those deformity technique correction techniques that we've talked about today, all the three column uh, posterior column osteotomy techniques that that you heard about, are very difficult to do in the least. So then came along this concept of the single position lateral surgery, which was keeping the patient in the decubitus position, doing the lateral work, and then at, at the very least fixing them. And th this, this is still very much uh, a frontier, except for the fact that there are difficulties with this too. Direct decompression for the same reason is difficult. The posterior alignment techniques can't easily be done. The inferior screw placement is challenging enough. Where do you position the patient? Is it close enough to the posterior aspect uh, of, uh, of, the, of the side of the bed where you can easily uh, place instrumentation without collision with the bed? At the same time, this means that uh, the anterior abdominal structures don't have the luxury of hanging free. And then there's issues of sterility. Uh, where do you place uh, the surgical technician for the case? you rotate the bed and hence risk uh, losing some traction with the tape and hence uh, losing the, the op optimal position that you wanted. All of this led 
to this concept of the lateral interbody fusion in the prone position. And this has been talked about here before. But I wanted to really emphasize what can be achieved with this uh, lateral and prone or prone lateral position. And I have to give homage to uh, these two gentlemen, to Louise Pimenta and Bill Taylor, who took me aside in April of 2019. And they really impressed on me uh, this, this technique that, that, that was present many years previously, but they uh, really kind of brought about a renaissance of it um, with, with what they were able to achieve. And I, I, I took it on board, and, and I've, I must tell you that uh, it's, it's benefited my practice ever since. And then, of course, Juan Uribe and Pedro Bergiano and Claudio Lamartina have published uh, as well on this. So, so this is a homage to those who have kind of helped pioneer this. So the technique is either being termed as pro x lift, single position prone lateral, or uh, prone transoas, or PTP. And essentially, it, I, I, you know, the way I view it is that it's, it's doing everything that you do lateral, but in the prone position. So me, it's lateral and prone. And that means that it's more than just the transoas work, because it's work above the psoas muscle and across the thoracolumbar junction, and possibly even other additions, such as anterior to psoas work and so on. So while it's definitely and majorly it's a transoas work, it is more than that. So to me, it's really lateral, but in the prone position. So I want to start off with a case that kind of illustrates what can be achieved. This was a 69-year-old gentleman who had a previous L45 decompression and inner body placed several years ago. He now presents with progressive back pain and neurogenic claudication. He's attempted a, a stimulator, but it hasn't helped, and that was removed. He's intact. So this is his kind of uh, three-foot standing imaging. He is in, in alignment. Uh, and balance, I must say. Uh, but if you look carefully, he has failure of instrumentation, especially across uh, the L5 uh, screws. And uh, he really didn't achieve any arthrodesis there uh, on the CT imaging. There, there, this is a, a good case of pseudoarthrosis leading to instrumentation fa failure. On the MRI, there's quite significant uh, canal stenosis, severe canal stenosis at L12 and L23. You can see that the canal is obliterated. Uh, and of course, he had his previous decompression at 4.5, but now he has failed instrumentation. So I always tell my residents that you have to be clear about the goals that you want to achieve. Outline the goals. What are your goals? And then craft a surgical strategy around it to achieve the goals. So the goals here were that, OK, we wanted to adequately treat the pseudoarthrosis at 4.5. And for us, that meant revising the inner body cage, right, as well as the instrumentation. Okay. We wanted to achieve decompression between L1 to 3 here in order to relieve his uh, neurogenic uh, claudication symptoms. We wanted to achieve adequate discite distraction and segmental lordosis across uh, L1 to at least. You can see the disc vacuum phenomenon there. And then we wanted to preserve that gain that we would achieve by fixation. So this is what we did. Uh, this, was a, this is a, a, a case of ours that's done, the, the lateral and prone. So the patient is positioned uh, in the usual prone, familiar position that we know. Uh, we, we tape them appropriately. Uh, we, there's a few nuances, such as uh, pre-rotation, which I'll talk about. Uh, we mark the patient, of course, uh, under X-ray imaging. And then eventually, you know, we're, we're placing our retractors um, with, with C on. This is the... the the, the C-arm under the table to give you the lateral view. And you can see it on the, uh, on the screen, on the fluoro screen. And then we get to work. And for, for my ergonomic benefit, we rotate the patient in a way that benefits me um, uh, in, in doing the surgery. And this is us placing uh, the large cage at L12. This is us then coming to Four five, and I've removed the uh, the the T lift implant from the side at four five, and placed the large lateral cage, and that's it there. And then uh, this is the implant that we placed at, at at four five. And so what we did was that we replaced that T lift cage with a with the with a big lateral cage at four five, lateral cage at one two, and decompress and fix from one to five, but all in the prone position. And this is kind of the final imaging that we obtained. And this kind of, th this hit the goals that we talked about. 
So why do it? Why, why perform this in the prone position? I mean, it's, it's well established now. Decubitus is, is uh, you know, a lot of uh, MIS surgeons incorporated as part of their practice. What is the game? Well, firstly, it's familiar positioning for, the, for, the, for every spine surgeon. You know, positioning prone is something that we're all used to. Secondly, it gives us the ability to perform all those posterior procedures without the need for the, the flip. And the flip does a few things that we don't like. Firstly, it increases OR time. It's labor intensive because you have to uh, be aware of patient safety issues with, with respect to flipping them. Sterility is involved. It takes time. There's new um, you know, ancillary equipment that needs to be brought back into the field. The bobies, bovi uh, needs to be changed out and, and so on, Sucker, suction and so on. So it's cost, costly as well to do it. But if you avoid a flip, you can then not only uh, place your percutaneous instrumentation, but you can open the patient and, and place uh, screws in an open position and do everything that you would have done in an open, prone uh, position in these patients. You can perform your direct decompression, and then you can employ your deformity correction techniques, your three, three column, your posterior column osteotomy techniques, or three column osteotomy techniques. There is not the contraindication to doing that in, a, in an awkward position. And of course, you can tackle L5S1 that you wouldn't without a flip when you did lateral. And there's good data now that you can achieve increased lordosis by positioning the patient in the prone position. We know that from a lot of data that's occurred throughout the years, and it stands to reason. So it gives you all the advantages of the lateral technique, you know, the great surface area for a big implant, disc height loss, lordosis, you know, doing ALL releases, and it lets you do all the prone procedures, and it's, it's a great option for achieving all of your goals. So this is a table that I love because it really makes me think. So when would we not do it? Let's flip the equation and ask, when wouldn't we do it compared to lateral decubitus? Let's see, okay. So if I want to place posterior instrumentation, obviously prone is a huge advantage, right? I think, I think this is clear. Direct decompression, a clear advantage. Lordosis through positioning them in a way that their, uh, the lumbar spine is able to hang free it's advantageous. Now, if they're large, uh, and uh, you know, for those of us that live in a demographic where that is the case, then the soft tissue that overhangs can be an issue that isn't present in the decubitus because it's it's uh, spread out in the decubitus position, if you like. If you're placing a plate only as part of an adjacent segment disease, then maybe you could argue that decubitus is is better. Up until now, that's what we've argued. Thoracic discectomy, anything where you need to bring in a microscope and so on. But for revision surgery, the question was at least, you know, th this is an experiential uh, discussion because at the beginning, we, we were wondering whether for revisions it was really, uh, you know, advantageous or not. And then what we found was actually, you know, the, the, the nice thing about it for adjacent segment disease is that we have the option of revising our posterior instrumentation. We can still fix a plate if we need to. For a thoracic corpectomy, it's now definitely equal in terms of advantage to the decubitus, and better because we can place our posterior instrumentation. And of course, for revision surgery, which involves uh, revising the uh, pre-existent instrumentation, it's significantly uh, advantageous because we don't flip. So to us, it appeared to be greatly advantageous. And I wanted to kind of go through some tips about what we do briefly. So we use the... Um, uh, Jackson table, which, which everybody has. We, we have the trios, which gives you a numerical figure with respect to rotation of the bed. The bed gives you about 25 degrees. Uh, we position them prone, but we, do, we, we add uh, some bolsters to the contralateral chest and the hips uh, together with taping, and that is to prevent lateral translation as we work uh, uh, of the patient as we work in that uh, lateral and prone position, because we're not only placing uh, uh, antibodies, but also the disc prep material, we're tapping them in, and in a way that, that reduces the retractor moving in and out too. And then, of course, you know, we, we, we place bolsters like we said, and, and we do that prior to a rotation for ergonomic benefit. 
So we've, we tape the patient, we mark them, and you have the choice of either standing or sitting. You know, for, for those of us who've actually gone through spine surgery, I had a discectomy, so for me, ergonomics is everything. You know, I like to stand, I like to minimally turn my neck, uh, you know, uh, in, in an awkward position. I find that if I stand and I work, if you like, obliquely, that is the most comfortable position. So for me, it's standing and rotating the patient, and we always rotate the patient once we've taped and, and um, uh, we, 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 we've put a securing kind of pads and pieces on to check that they're okay. And uh, like I said, we put bolsters on, straps and tapes, and, and we turn them. And the, the slight um, nuance to the incision is that we take it a little bit more posteriorly to the level of the foramen, because that means that uh, it, it accounts for the ventral drop with respect to uh, the soft tissue structures on the way in. And we make sure that the C-arm is always orthogonal to the disc space. So this is a, a, a little video um, of, of us at work here. So this is us having pa uh, positioned the patient prone with the bolsters on the contralateral side. We mark out the patient in the prone position. Then we rotate them and we check. And, and we're checking that uh, with the C-arm in place too to make sure we get the right you know, the AP uh, field. We know what, what a good AP angle is. And then at that point, uh, we, we progress on and we make our incision. We dissect down. This is with the patient in the completely prone position. I like to dock with them in the completely prone position. A little bit of a dance of the cerebellars there to get us uh, to the uh, through, through the uh, retroperitoneum and onto the psoas muscle. There's our first few dilators with neuromonitoring. Our K-wire in. So in other words, all of the usual steps that you would employ with lateral, uh, you do uh, in, the, in the lateral position, in the prone position. And you can see that we've placed our screw instrumentation in already. And now we're doing our disc prep work and Cobs and, and uh, once we've done our disc prep work, we get into uh, using a trial. There's the cobs there. And there's the expandable trial. We, we like an expandable system. And so that lets us kind of do a little bit more segmental lordosis and, and, and so on there. There's my resident kind of taking up the disk space. And there's the implant, uh, and we're, we're post-packing it with um, you know, your bone graft of choice there. And at the end, uh, you know, we, we've, we've achieved, uh, th this is the part that Rod asked me to put in uh, specifically, which was the, the robotic uh, uh, screw insertion. I think this is, this is a, an, an, another, uh, Another case to that. But, but that's our final kind of implant. So there's another case that I think demonstrates its advantages too. So this, this gentleman underwent an L2 to pelvis uh, uh, surgery six months previously as a revision. And now he presents with severe progressive weakness in his lower extremities and low back pain. And here he is. So he, he's presenting now with rather uh, extreme failure immediately uh, at the top instrumentation, top screw level, which is backed out, and very significant, significant kyphosis at that L23 disc space. In reality, what he had, and you can kind of, you know, see it, is that he had a uh, discitis and part osteomyelitis that had occurred at the cranial aspect of his previous construct. And he's, he's presenting with very severe spinal cord compression, uh, both on the, on the uh, sagittal and axial. You can appreciate almost the obliteration of the canal there and failure of the instrumentation here too. And so when we position them for surgery, you can see the kyphus that's present there uh, across the, uh, the, the previous surgery and at the top of the construct. So we've marked out 
our, our entry point for both posterior and lateral. So again, we position the patient. Here they are, marked out posteriorly. This is the X-ray image superimposed. You can appreciate the severe kyphos that's there. To some extent, it's improved with positioning them prone, and that's one of the major advantages of it. But it wasn't complete, complete correction. And then this is what we did. So of course, we, we placed, we removed the failed instrumentation. We extended them to T10. And then we did our disc prep work. And we placed our inner body cage in. And this was the result that we were able to get. And so um, this was the final outcome. And so we did everything. It was, we, we avoided a, a, a PSO, a VCR, a corpectomy with an expandable cage. And just through the disc work in the prone position, with the advantage of positioning the patient in that prone position, uh, together with our Smith-Peterson osteotomy, we were able to fix it. And that was all done in the prone position. I think this, and this is the pre and the post-op kind of imaging uh, there too with the correction. So what about other indications? This was a 59-year-old male that presented with known metastatic lung cancer. Uh, he, he really essentially presented with pain and pain-related weakness. This was his MRI imaging. You can see it's isolated to L3. Uh, and then we decided to do the corpectomy in the prone position. Why? And the, and the reason is that there are advantages, both in terms of being able to do everything uh, in the one uh, position, but mainly because we could put a larger cage in, even compared to trying to put a cage, uh, finagling a cage around the lumbar nerve roots that you would from a pure posterior approach. Uh, and that, uh, we felt, um, really did him uh, the best or, or, or provided the best support uh, in a case of, um, uh, of, of cancer, uh, neoplastic lesion. And so here, here is uh, our usual positioning with them prone. Um, this is us working in the lateral position. This is us doing our osteotomies there, uh, putting in our expandable uh, cage. And this is the final construct here too. Um, for a corpectomy done again in the prone position. So then I wanted to kind of talk about our, our experience of these cases. So we've done 35 patients to date now. Uh, we first started in July of 19. Uh, the pandemic kind of slowed us down for a, a few months. Our average age is uh, 60, in mid 60s as you'd expect. Uh, most cases were done on the left side. Uh, few from the right where there was a clear advantage with respect to the crest and so on. And in one case, of, uh, a deformity, uh, we've done it from a bilateral approach. Uh, and I think you know, that, that's really one of the major advantages here uh, is that you can tackle uh, very eccentrically positioned disc spaces uh, from either side to, to place your inner body cages to get maximal benefit for your deformity correction. And then, of course, the vast majority of posterior fixations were traditional pedicle screws. Uh, then per percutaneous pedicle screws, cortical screws in some cases as part of an MIS construct, and of course, you know, in the rest, we, we, we place the lateral plate for adjacent segment disease. Most cases that we do prone or lateral and prone are still single level, uh, but two levels, three levels, and, and four levels we've, we, we've done uh, for um, that deformity correction. Blood loss is acceptable for that for a lateral approach. Uh, length of stay. Uh, we've used expandable cages in, 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 in the vast majority of cages, cases. And then these are our indications. So the majority were degenerative disc disease, um, instrumentation revision, deformity correction uh, in four patients, adjacent segment disease, discitis osteomyelitis, uh, the corpectomy case that we demonstrated before, in one case, we performed a spinal shortening osteotomy for recurrent tethered cord syndrome. Uh, again, the advantage there was that we're able to do our anterior work with our uh, shortening osteotomy and then have uh, screw fixation. This is the deformity case um, preoperatively uh, that, that, we, that we fixed. And then uh, a sizable amount were revision cases as well in addition to 25 primary uh, cases. So what about complications? Well, you know, I, I don't think that the complication profile is that different with respect to uh, the decubitus position. 
uh, we had up to 30%, but immediate hip flexion weakness uh, from the procedure. Uh, but the vast majority of them had resolved by, by six week uh, follow-up, as is what we would expect. In one case, uh, we, we failed uh, with respect to, to the, the cage placement, and that was because there was a rupture of the anterior longitudinal ligament, and the implant kept being pushed ventrally. And so with the patient positioned in the prone position, uh, it, it, it really was minimal uh, time wastage to uh, then uh, pack the wound, reopen posteriorly, uh, make it an open incision, and place a T-lift a Cajun uh, from the back. Uh, so that was a, that was an advantage. One, one other case was uh, that we removed a lateral graft that we placed. Uh, we actually got it in the perfect position, but in, in packing, uh, the cage uh, malrotated. And uh, ironically enough, we were able to go to the other side uh, to retrieve it, as, as we, were, we were going to the other side for deformity uh, anyway, for the deformity anyway. So we were able to retrieve it because it was, it was pushed a little further and it was more advantageous to be taken from the other side. So where is the future um, with, with this? Where, where are we going? So obviously, the, the research now is really attempting to quantify the increase in segmental lordosis that we get uh, by having patients in this position. And then what is the impact on the psoas and the lumbar plexus when you position them prone? Is it that the, that the psoas and the plexus are moved posteriorly because effectively the hip is now an extension versus uh, hip flexion that you'd have them in, in, in lateral decubitus? And then how, how is efficiency uh, quantified in the OR? Is it time spent? Uh, is it blood loss? Is it all of the above? Um, and you know there, there are others that have talked about uh, segmental lordosis. Uh, this is one Uribe's paper on spondees and increased, increased segmental lordosis. But also role of navigation and robotics too. And where does that play with it? To me, I think that you know, it's the indications that are really expanding. Now we're able to do deformities. Uh, we, we, we can perform our corpectomies. And maybe even other frontiers, such as anterior to psoas work as well uh, in this position. So you know, the indications are increasing. We're able to achieve. Uh, more and more as we do more of these cases. And I think that this is an exciting new frontier uh, for lateral surgery, which, which optimizes uh, positioning to give us the best benefits of lateral uh, together with everything that we would have done prone. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So uh, news that was terrific. Can you go back to seeing yeah. your positioning? So um, you're kind of doing an oblique approach, basically. Well, I mean, because you're turning the patient, right? Yeah, I'm turning the patient, but um, so it's not really. I would say I'm gonna I'm gonna critique you a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you're not really going. So that's not really. I mean, you're prone, but then, but no, then you're going oblique, right? No, no. This is absolutely direct lateral. So I keep them direct lateral yeah. for. Uh, the 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 directly prone for the position, yeah. uh, a direct but then, lateral. But then approach. you tilt the table. Only once the retractor is in. Okay. So the retractor is placed in the complete prone position, ex identical to what I do. But in why a do you why do you have why do you tilt the patient? I tilt them for ergonomic reasons. So okay. because uh, you know I could sit yeah. and keep the patient completely prone, uh, but I I'm I, I'm getting yeah. old, um, and so. Um, I still I still need to figure out the fountain of youth that that, that you drink, uh, Rod. So um, it, it's harder for me yeah. to sit and be working like this with my arms up and occasionally my neck needing to do this. So it's much easier for me to stand up, have the patient tilt, and that's why they're taped mm -hmm. and bolstered. Uh, a part of the reason they're bolstered. And then what bolsters? Can you go back to yeah. the bolsters? One? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So what are those bolsters like? So it, it's interesting, and, and this is like. Part of, part of yeah. the issue, right? Um, I think we have one where the bulk yeah, there. Right so there. These, these are just orthopedic Sullenberg bolsters present in every OR. Huh. If you have orthopedic surgeons doing hip surgery in your OR, you have these bolsters. Huh. They're nothing new. You don't need to buy them, buy anything new. I think that um, some, some of the vendors have come up with their own patient positioner to help with the bolsters. Mm -hmm. and, and you know this is a field that's being developed to help with both coronal uh, kind of tilt, if you like, 
uh, coronal bend as well as axial rotation mm -hmm. to maximize it for deformity patients. But you, th I bet you this is on your, on your shelf already. And so we're positioning one across the hip, so below the iliac crest, mm -hmm. and the other just at the level of the ribs. And it takes no time to, to set it up. And we just tape directly over it. So it's a facile way of um, you know, fixing them, basically. Um, so, yeah. I mean, to me, it's, it's very uh, intriguing um, uh, to go prone lateral, because as you said, you don't have to turn the patient. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, it's, it's very, uh, very cool what you demonstrated um, and what you've shown here. So, yeah, I, you know, I think yeah. it's just an, an evolution, right, yeah. of the same technique. I yeah, mean, yeah. we do this yeah. all the time. Yeah. So why not maximize it? Yeah. 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 Roland has a question for yeah. you. Great uh, uh, talk. I really appreciate it. I was wondering if you could just touch on two things. One, mm. the learning curve for someone who's already very familiar with the lateral approach. Yeah. Now converting to a, uh, a lateral and prone position. And then two, uh, you know, when contemplating a lateral approach for every patient, there are several factors that you sort of take into consideration, including uh, iliac crest heights, mm. uh, vascular anatomy, psoas morphology, and mm -hmm. rotation of the lumbar sacral plexus. Yeah. Do any of those things change? No. Right. So it's such a good question. Firstly, I think the people that will really appreciate this are the people who are doing lateral surgery. So the, the learning, the, the steepness of the learning curve is in the positioning, not in the disc prep and any of the lateral work. I mean, there are slight nuances, of course, because there is a down, downward vector from gravity that wants to bring the retractor ventral. But if you fix the retractor in the place that, that you want it to remain, and you can do that with some screw, uh, uh, retracting pins, if you like, or pins through retractor. Most systems, I guess, have the ability to pass a pin there or a screw. Um, you know, that's halfway there. Uh, everything else you're, you're familiar with. And, and you just need to have the, the sense and the whereabouts that there is a gravitational component that wants to drive that implant ventrally. For me, that's the reason why I like the expandable cages, because I'm not trying to force a static cage with that additional vector of taking me anteriorly. Um, to your question about um, all the other, uh, all the other aspects are still there. You know, you need to consider uh, the psoas uh, morphology and anatomy. You need to be judicious with, you know, what you do. Can it can it really be done at at four five? Um, if anything. One thing, uh, so I, I never broke the bed much with lateral decubitus. And you know, I, I really learned it from my time in fellowship, which, which I think by that stage, we'd learned that you didn't need to break the bed crazy. Uh, but you, you can do a little bit of that here as well by providing bolster support and taping them in a way to just pull down the iliac crest. And so it actually gives you slight advantages to four five when the crest is a little bit high too. And I think, you know, um, like I said, some, some vendors have the patient positioner and, and so it is able, you are, you'd be surprised, you are able to kind of push the crest down and the ribs up a little bit. And I, and I think that, that was kind of surprising to me too because we'd never considered it in the prone position. So all ones that are using curved instrumentation for L5 Believe it or not, it, it's, for some reason, I've used it minimally. The angled instrumentation has been used less than I thought, and I think it's partly because we tape them in a way such that we're able to pull on the crest a little bit. So, you know, you saw that horizontal tape I was able to place, and then the vertical tape down the leg to the other side. Um, I think the, 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 the real research now is where's the position of the psoas muscle? Because you extend the, the, the thigh, um, you know, are you actually pulling the psoas muscle back? And as a result, are you pulling the, the, the plexus back? Haven't really seen much of a difference in terms of, you know, the, the neuropraxias and, and, the, and the sensory disturbance and the hip flexion weakness, but some of that is the mechanical trans psoas work as well. Is your workflow for the robot in uh, using an OR massage? Yeah. So yeah. So. You see that psoas Definitely, I, I, I think this is the value of navigation here and, and robotics. I, I think that, so my workflow is instrumentation in first, uh, and then because I have the navigation, I can use that either to help the dilator dock 
through the psoas muscle in, in its eventual place. And of course, with all the updates in software technology, when there, you know, we don't have it, but, but there's interbody software technology now that's able to drive you. And you can, uh, you know, the goal will be to mm -hmm. remove C arm altogether from this and completely exclude radiation from this. Yeah. That's a terrific talk, yeah. uh, Noosh. Really great work. Mm. Now you have to write it up. So yeah, let's yeah, that's write the it hard up. Part, Come right? on. <laughs> I'm going to make you write up. Great job. I'm really proud of all the work that you're doing in Arkansas. And um, this is really exciting. I mean, I think, um, you know, there's, there's so much opportunity in this area. Yeah. So I look forward to um, having you back next year to talk about yeah. your uh, experience. And I'm sure it'll evolve a lot more. Yeah, I hope so, I hope you know yeah. we get some more numbers and so on and uh, add add to the publications. Great. Yeah, thank you.